more than we did this, yeah. this afternoon. I thought we were talking about what we thought we know all the time. And sometimes uh, this is underpinned with real verifiable knowledge, but very often we think we know or we think we don't know. And so what I hope to talk about in this uh, presentation is, uh, is what we do with scientific endeavors. This is to, to create a world of verifiable knowledge. This is something we can read and we can look up and we can verify and we can look at the data and recalculate everything. And this is what science tries to do. And uh, so this afternoon I had a feeling we, we are doing something very unscientific because we are creating a world of what we think we know. And sometimes this is underpinned, sometimes it isn't. But I think it's very important to have verifiable knowledge because when, the, uh, when it really matters, for example, you have to fight a court case for spoon bills, for example, all of a sudden verifiable knowledge is the kind of thing we need. Mm -hmm. So I think actually this kind of stuff is important for uh, protecting habitats or species. Well, that's a bit of background. So this is my last slide I made this afternoon as, as we were having our uh, discussion. Also because I'm not totally sure that our uh, colleagues in the, in the IEVA type of world recognize the importance of verifiable knowledge. That was one of the reasons I put it up. But that's a discussion point for tonight. Right. Underpinning the conservation of spoonbills and other migrating sandpipe uh, water birds. And what I want to talk about is monitor the links in change of wetland habitats. After all, a lot of these animals, they connect wetland habitats. And a, a fantastic example is actually something we discovered yesterday. Uh, this is a spoonbill on a nest on Schiemelijk Oog in the Netherlands in the Dutch Water Sea. Uh, photographed with a remote uh, camera, sensitive camera, on the nest with four chicks. And we called it the Senegalese spoonbill. But it turns out that uh, Isatou Ibet has seen it. So now it changed its name to Isatou Ibet. In the colony, and she has seen it on the, I think it was the 27th of October in the Juge. And here's a connection between the Water Sea and the Juge. It's a very simple story, but this is what, uh, what uh, unites us here. The people from Hungary and, and Croatia having lots of links with Tunisia. And of course, uh, Tano will be working on a connection too uh, between the link between Tunisia and uh, the Netherlands by her crossbreeding experiments. We'll see whether it's also her. So this is the connectedness. And then, from the point of view of conservation, we look at these chains, and what we're really interested in is whether there is any weak link in the chain. Because as you know, the chain is as strong as its weakest link. So from the conservation point of view, mm. this is what we have to determine. Now, you immediately see there is also Spanish text in some of my slides. I uh, gave part of these slides uh, last year in the presentation in, uh, obviously, uh, a Spanish-speaking country in uh, Peru, and Juan Aredo translated all my English text in, uh, in Spanish, so I thought I'll leave it there, in honor of uh, Juan. Uh, so you can read it if you, if you, uh, if you know Spanish. Mm. So, what could be these weakest links? This could be a place or it could be a season, and I split it up in the, in the following way. I cut a case in the following way. We're talking here about long distance so maybe the weakest links in the chain is actually the migratory flight. Flight is very expensive. Uh, spoonbells are, uh, they are powerful flyer, but not extremely powerful flyer. And a lot of people have thought that, uh, for example, the longer the flight, the more difficult it is. So maybe in general for uh, spoonbills and other water birds, the migratory flights represent a week in the chain. We're we, we going to look at that. And other possibility is, of course, that during the staging, when they fuel up for the next migratory flight, that could be the weakest link in the chain. The wintering, the time of wintering, could be form the weakest link in the chain. And, of course, the breeding period could also be the weakest link in the chain. In population dynamics, Terms, of course, if you don't 
to lose any recruits, that's not very good for the population. So you could all that, also call that a, a link in the chain. But uh, what I mainly talk about here is the rest of the talk is survival. Now you might wonder, we are talking about a species that is actually increasing in number in many, many different places. And the spoon belt has just taken out of the action plan for the breeding birds in the modern sea. It's the only species that's not there. The reason is that it's increasing. So people think, oh, there's no problem. So uh, we don't need to, uh, to put it in an action plan. And actually, this is an action, I think, that should also be in the, in the report to AVA. That's a ridiculous thing to do, I think. And I'll explain why later on. Well, I borrowed a couple of slides and then modified them a little bit from some of the speakers here. And this is a slide uh, from Andrew uh, Bloomfield's uh, story. And he pointed out that, uh, that uh, spoon wells were actually quite common in the, in the UK, especially in East Anglia. Uh, and they were actually uh, served as, uh, as food on the, on the big parties of the, of the, of the gentry of, uh, of the middle-aged Englishmen. Uh, we don't know how many there were, but uh, we know they were there, and you could say that what we see right now, starting in Holcomb, is a kind of recovery of that pattern. And actually, we had a similar kind of experience in Leidenham, which is a, an East Anglian little town, a market town, uh, full of wool combers, I think uh, they are, and here is a, a medieval church, and in the church, uh, our friend Rodney. <laughs> I don't know why it has this funny uh, <laughs> symbol there. Every slide is no, it's not a problem. This is Rodney West. Oh. Ah. Well, he is Rodney. You see, he has a very friendly face. <laughs> and Rodney is sitting here in a chair, and he, what he discovered in this chair actually was a, of a sculpture of an ibis. Oh no, these are actually two spool bills. So we were there just uh, walking, and uh, we, we were uh, not even talking spoon belts at all. We went, and all of a sudden there was this uh, sculpted chair with a spoon belt from the 14th century. And there were other uh, bird sculptures too that sort of living in the, in the fence around Leiden at the time. I think there were cranes as well. Interesting. And actually uh, there was also on one of the seats was a, a copy of that uh, particular sculpture. So in a place, that in, in, the, in the known history, more or less, uh, the written history has nothing to do with spoon belts, you still find these remains. And we know that in the Netherlands, spoon belts have been extremely abundant. Now, this is an, uh, a famous picture, or one of the few pictures, of uh, the bull of Foppen Polder, which is even in Dutch, is a, is a strange word, uh, a picture of a, a huge colony in the, in the 18th century. And, uh, and the story is that uh, the bakers from Amsterdam would row their boats into this colony to collect the eggs to, uh, to bake their cakes or something. That was the, the story at the time. And there must have been hundreds, and probably uh, this was uh, something regular. You see some other interesting species there too. Anyway, we know that they have gone through uh, the bottle in the early 60s, and then now the school builds in the Netherlands are recovering. Obviously, the species without problems, and we have seen the same thing for for France, with this amazing jump in 2013, when according to Lloyd, the, the French birds since then are booming. So should we bother at all about identifying weak links in the chain? Well, maybe we should. So this is the question, Do should we bother? Maybe we should, because we also saw another picture, and uh, we can uh, show us this uh, picture of the changing phase of the wintering spoon belts in Tunisia. So it's not an exponential increase. Something is going on there. And if it would really serve the spoon belts and the protection, we would like to know what is going on. But finding these answers is not a trivial uh, thing to do. And I just want to give you one more pictorial about this changing world. This is uh, obviously the, the East Atlantic part of the flyway as we see it today. It's, it's just a rough sketch. Breeding birds in the Netherlands and then three wintering locations. And as we've just seen, this must have been very different with uh, huge numbers in, at least in the, in the UK, probably also in the Netherlands, and maybe also huge numbers 
wintering in West Africa. And the reason I say this is that uh, a place like uh, the Senegal Delta must have been a formidable wintering area for school belts for a long, long time. And this was the same situation around 1960, when the change of the Senegal Delta hasn't yet started. And now look what has happened in the time since then. The whole Senegal Delta has all but disappeared. And what we still know is a huge, as a little pocket of water that's also managed for birds where these birds now rely on. And on the Mauritanian side of the Senegal Delta, we have the Jaolin nature reserve with similar kind of management. But obviously this has led to huge changes in the fate of, uh, of our wildlife, so we don't know anything about it. But these things, of course, uh, are in a continuous flux. So the point I want to make already now is that what is a weak link in the chain now is not necessarily a weak link in the chain tomorrow, but it has everything to do with uh, these migrations because things change. Right, this was just the introduction of the topic. I'm now go going to introduce uh, a little bit myself so you have a bit of background because for a little while I'm not going to talk about spoonbills actually, I'm going to talk about other water birds, I'm going to talk about your bird. Well, this picture was taken this morning, just to point out that I love shallow water. Uh, so I totally feel at home here because we have shallow water here. I also love mud. We don't have a lot of mud on the Vinci premises. And I work at two institutions in the North Netherlands, at the University of Groningen and at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research. And these are two very complementary kind of institutions. Groningen, you could say, is an intellectual bastion. And of course, NEOS is as well, but NEOS has a lot of logistics to do work on the intertidal flats. Well, they are 150 kilometers apart, and uh, it's all adjacent to the Dutch part of the International Water Sea, a very extensive area of intertidal flats. Almost as good as the Gulf of Gabes, <laughs> which I don't know, but uh, anyway, this is our equivalent. And from Tessel, we have the, uh, the possibility to go out on the mudflats and study the birds there. So just to point out, I'm not here uh, uh, alone, let me see, oh, I'm going back. What is see, Tamara, she, uh, at the moment she works at, uh, at NEO, she lives on Tessel. Uh, Petra, she, uh, at the moment she uh, works at Groningen, but also spends two days a week on Tessel. And together with Petra, uh, I live at this uh, place exactly halfway these two places. So that's what we do, we move about all the time. So, this is uh, my life and Pezo life. I'm going to introduce a couple of methods that we use to study these weak links in the chain. And I do that because it's a combination <coughs> of field methods, but it's also combined with uh, lab methods. And one of the most uh, common methods is that we make birds individual. And uh, I don't have to explain you because you, uh, all of you also make birds individual, but it's, it's uh, interesting uh, to know that uh, waders, shorebirds in, in Dutch are called uh, stealth walkers, which uh, amounts as much to uh, stilt walkers, and swoonbirds, you could say, is also a stealth walker. So they have long legs, and long legs are fantastic to put color rings on. <laughs> and they live in open habitat, so you can actually go out and read the color rings. Obviously, this is a, a, a Portuguese, uh, a mural. Uh, so, in order to find out, we do a lot of demographic work, which amounts to catching birds in various places along the flyways, and then going out to see which individuals are alive. <coughs> and when you don't see an uh, individually marked individuals, it can mean that it's either dead or you haven't seen it. And people like Tamer have spent uh, many years of their life to learn how to tell death and not being seen apart. That's a statistical exercise that you then also have to put in. Now we also like to understand why <coughs> survival is high or why survival is low. So this is the survival part. 
Uh, and of course, we also need to study recruitment. But as I said, I'm going to focus especially on survival. But survival is the one minus mortality. And this links to other factors. And if you have a food pyramid, and I've drawn a food pyramid here, you could say that if you have a red knot, a species that uh, mm. our group spends a lot of time on, we've done lots of studies on them, on the one hand, their numbers and their distribution depends on predators like the peregrine falcon. This is less of a problem for full bills, but that will change in the future, I can predict, because white-tailed eagles get increasingly numbers. So full bills very soon will have a predator too, but it will also, of course, link to the food resources. Hmm. And in the case of the red knot, that is the uh, mollusks that sit in intertidal mudflats which are a function of the food that these intertidal bird resources take. So this is the food chain. So in order to understand what the birds do, ideally you have to understand what predators of these birds do and what the food does. So this has spawned from NIOS extensive programs to measure uh, food resources in the water sea. And this is one example See, that's where we map the benthic resources in the whole one sea, it's a big area, it's 4,000 uh, points that we measure every year in order to map the food resources. So we take this uh, super series and what you can then do if you know enough of your bird and you know a hell of a lot of red knot, you can actually produce maps of predicted intake rates. So that's a long story that will take me a whole evening to explain that. But this is a food landscape turned into a uh, resource landscape from the bird point of view. So when it's redder, uh, not that's feeding there will have a higher intake rate. And what you can then do is of course plot the distribution of knots on the food distribution. That's the kind of thing we do in order to find out uh, the relationship between what happens to the population and the food resources. Now, this was a little more see whether I can make it move. No, yeah, it doesn't work here either. So it was beautiful, so the same problem as you have done. But uh, this was a beautiful animation of uh, not sort of moving over mud flats because what we try to understand is uh, trying uh, to understand the movements on a small scale, which we also do for uh, spoon bills, and uh, putting their movements on these resource landscapes. So this was one example. And of course, we also try to study them large scale. And we have seen several examples here for the school bill. And the nice thing now with the, include, uh, the increasing miniaturization of, uh, of the tags, we can actually you see this plot in the middle, that uh, the smallest tags are getting ever smaller. And we are now down to two gram tags that we can actually successfully put on red knots to uh, study their movements over the world. And you see two examples of the work I've been involved with, uh, with here. One uh, on, the, on the left is of uh, Bato Godlets that we marked in West Africa, in Oman, and in Northwest Australia, and how they move to the Arctic to breed. And the other one is our single track, or the two tracks of a single red knot called Paula, which uh, showed us that indeed red knots fly right over the Greenland ice cap. So it's fantastic to, to be able to do these kind of uh, things. So that's the last scale. And finally, uh, to find out mechanisms underpinning the relationship between food and between what birds do, you almost always need to do birds, need to take birds in captivity and figure out particular things. Well, we don't have much of a history of this in spoonbills at all. We have a big history, uh, and I'll give you some examples later on in the, in the short words. And we actually do this kind of work with captive experiments on the tundra. We have a special facility at NEOS, which is fantastic because we can remake intertidal mud flats. We could use it for small girls too, now we're thinking about it. And uh, we also take birds indoors uh, in Bangladesh in Mauritania, mm -hmm. a place where I'll take you quite a lot in the next uh, half hour. One other little thing is that uh, a lot of the work we do is under the umbrella of a little organization called Global Flowery Network, which is kind of a, a little organization to make these things possible. 
Sometimes they are possible to do these things through your institutions, sometimes it's not. So in 2006, uh, together with Alan Baker uh, from Canada, we founded a global farming network, the Shorebird Ecological Demographics and Conservation Initiative. Initially, this was only shorebirds, but uh, as an honorary wader, poor bills, at least in my head, are part of this, the same syndrome. And this is the kind of the, the flowers that we study across the world. And what it unites us is the same kind of approach of trying to do serious demographics, trying to interpret the trends mm -hmm. with uh, knowledge on food, and trying to determine the weak link in the chain. Well, you can follow Global Flower Network uh, through Twitter if you're on it. Personally, I'm not on it, but we do have a Twitter server. And this is a, a tweet of uh, yesterday of uh, Isa too and, and Peter and, and uh, Tamar celebrating the, uh, the observation. <laughs> so the world knows about it. I hope you like it. And you can also follow us on the, on the, on the internet if you, if you would like to. Good. An introduction of the persons and the methods and uh, the outcomes. Let's go back to uh, these migratory birds and what they tell us about the world, the possible weak links. Now, if you go into the bird literature, uh, you will find lots of statements. Of, wow, flight is very, very difficult, and uh, for sure, uh, long distance migration uh, takes a toll. So, in my head, before we started this work, I always thought that, uh, okay, so if you are a spoonbill that migrates a short distance, say uh, from the Netherlands to France, uh, it will have a high survival. If it migrates a long distance, say from the Netherlands to Senegal, it has a low end of survival. And actually, this turns out to be true. But it's not, and I'll come back to that in the end of my talk, but it's not a general rule. Because actually these birds, of course, are specialized long-distance flyers. Mm. Full builds and the, and the shore birds also. And as an example uh, of a very specialized long-distance uh, flyer, followed by satellite telemetry, is this Baron Godrat. And this is a, a particular individual called E7. I don't know. Does anybody know E7 here in the group? No. no. You're not aware of E7. Good. Then now you're aware of E7. E7 was a that was captured in New Zealand and got an implanted satellite track. This was the technology in 2008 it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, this bird flew to China, the Yellow Sea, made a stopover of uh, three or four weeks, flew to Alaska, did a breeding attempt, and then flew back to New Zealand, crossing the whole Pacific. And this was something we were actually after. And then the battery died just before it landed in uh, New Zealand. So this was the first proof that uh, they can fly further than 5,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. It was already a 10,000 kilometer flight to the Yellow Sea. And they can actually continuously fly for nine nights and days continuously during the flight from Alaska to New Zealand. So that was quite a, a big discovery. So we love that, of course, this little high <laughs> uh, migration. And this also triggers questions whether this extreme migration uh, actually has survival repercussions, because we already knew that these Bantam Dottas in New Zealand had quite, quite high survival. So Jesse Conkley, uh, an American guy that did his PhD in, uh, in New Zealand and is now working with us in Groningen, and, uh, and some of us, uh, we, we, we uh, looked at putting this idea that long distance migration has a survival cost to a test in the group of long distance migrating shorebirds, uh, including plovers and, and sandpipers. So, of course, when you're a bigger species, you have a higher survival, and that's what this uh, plot shows. And then we have different kinds of species the short distance migrants and the long distance migrants. And the very long distance migrants are these red dots. And you can immediately see that. Well, they don't stand out as having a particularly low annual survival. So you can also plot this in a different way. This is on, uh, on wing court, but if you, uh, if you take, the, uh, take the, uh, the difference between the predicted line on body mass 
and the survival, and you plot it on that maximal one-way migration distance, you find it, again, totally no evidence that long-distance flights necessarily lead to lower annual survival, which would then have to lead, for constant populations, to higher recruitment. Of course, that would be the other side of the coin. So actually, nothing changes. These birds are adapted to do these things. So, there's no evidence that long-distance migration is costly in survival terms. Of course, it is costly in energetic terms. So this is the exit of the migratory flight as a necessarily weak link in the chain. That's not necessary. But we'll come back to this in the end of the talk with the school of example. So this is a picture of the countryside I uh, grew up in, in the Netherlands, with a, a bird standing here on the pole. That's a, that's a black-tailed goblet. And a black-tailed goblet, actually, a longland species, is the national bird of the Netherlands. Mm. It was voted with more than half of the votes as the national bird. So we're very proud of it. And there's a good reason to be uh, proud of it, because of this particular population, 85% breeds in the Netherlands. And actually, we think about it as a bird that has been uh, kind of uh, evolved together with our farming practices, the dairy farming that uh, the Netherlands is famous for. Now it's not doing very well at all, but that's not the point of, uh, that I want to make here. The point I want to make here is a little study on what could be the weakest link and weakest uh, link in the chain of black goblins that are migrating between the Netherlands breeding grounds and West Africa, because that's what they do. So here you see uh, the tracks of uh, satellite tag black tailed goblins, and actually all these tracks are based on satellite tag goblins that were marked in the Spanish Extremadura. So uh, Juan was part of that at the time, and uh, this is uh, Pipe and Jorge uh, putting satellite tags on birds and uh, Jorge releasing one of these birds, and this is the kind of tracks you saw. Now we've done, uh, I think, 70 of these birds by now. And this means that uh, because the birds die faster than the satellite tag stop, mm. not always, but in almost all cases, we can actually use that to uh, plot the time of death in the course of the, of the year. So what uh, Nathan Center, a postdoc in our group, has done is plot daily survival rate as a function of very detailed phases of the annual cycle. And some phases are very short, the migration flights, and some phases are much longer, like the breeding period. And that's, uh, that's plotted in the lower uh, plot, where you see the proportional mortality happening during particular times of the year. Now if you look at the, uh, at the top graph, it, it looks like kind of a, well, survival rate is very high throughout the year. So again, migratory flights don't set up, except for this period. That's actually the time they cross the Sahara from either Senegal or southern Mauritania across the Sahara to southern Spain. And uh, the fact that this, uh, this figure is low is due to several birds, actually three birds, that were dying in the same freak Sahara storm. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of an accident. Now it could be a regular accident, which would make flights across the Sahara during northern migration costly, or it could be an artifact. But uh, that's what it is. But what you see actually is that most of the mortality occur occurs during the breeding season. We also know that uh, and this is due to, partly due to predators uh, taking birds from the nest. That's one, one source of mortality that we know about. It's also due to, so these could be flying predators like goshawk, chase them up the nest and then grab them. Uh, it can also be due to uh, even foxes taking birds from the nest. We also know that, the, uh, uh, that reproduction is a problem for the goblins at the moment because the chicks don't find enough food to eat. So definitely you would in this case say that uh, breeding is the weakest link in the chain of the black goblins right now. 
Now, with all this, so by, by now you have thought, well, okay, well, so it's not uh, locus in flight necessarily. Uh, something is happening during the northern flight across the Sahara, this is breeding. So you could actually ask the question, do we have a null hypothesis? Do we have an expectation what, uh, whether there should be particular weak links in the chain? Or phrase it a different way, should there be particular times of the year that survival is lower than other times of the year? Mm. That's a question you can ask. Well, actually, Elder Rakovidiev, a postdoc in our group, asked this question. So I said, what is the what do we expect for a seasonal survival? Do we expect it to be constant or variable? And as I said in the beginning, what all the have said, wow, migration, that's the time that they die. And of course, then, if you look at the literature, you'll find examples that birds die during a particular time of the year. But actually, and I, you can read this in this uh, particular paper if you're interested, but we came to the conclusion that actually, constant seasonal survival is the expectation for a population that is in balance with its resources. And just intuitively you can imagine this. So imagine that you have a higher mortality during a particular time of the year. That selection will be towards individuals that cope with this lower mortality because the ones that don't survive, they disappear. So that will sort of compensate the problems if that's possible. So in a, in a population that is in balance in numbers, with the resources, you actually uh, expect constant season, seasonal survival, or phrased in a different way. You don't even expect weak links in the chain. So that's the theoretical prediction. Now this is super interesting, because it also means that when you have dips in your seasonal survival, that it means something. So it's ecologically informative. It means that Birds really have problems during that particular time of the year. And you can look and, uh, and try to find a reason for the fact that the season survival is low. So that's the, the flip side of this conclusion. I'm not sure that you believe this, but uh, I kind of live in this world now and I find aberrations from constant season survival actually really interesting. We just had a black dog doctor, and we can go and look at some more examples. So we go to uh, well, you could call it my favorite species, the red knot, which is a high arctic breeder. And there's co a couple of populations around the world, and we are talking now about a population in uh, central northern Siberia mm -hmm. of the Colutus subspecies, a population of about 200,000 birds that breed on an area of 50,000 kilometers, square kilometers of tundra, and then migrate across the western flower, it's almost, uh, they, they catch up with the, the spoon belt at some point, and then 